those technical data scientist people, um, they have almost certainly heard of your work through your iconic piece called Data Scientist, The Sexiest Job of the 21st Century, an article that is now almost 11 years old. Um, and you followed up in July of 2022 with uh, an article, Is Data Scientist Still the Sexiest Job of the 21st Century? So um, what's happened, Tom, over that intervening decade? Uh, how did the roles demand requirements and challenges change? Yeah, and I should say that both of those were co-authored with DJ Patil. And I made a good prediction in seeking a co-author. He became, um, uh, after we wrote that uh, first article, he became the first chief data scientist of the United States of America in the White House. So that, that worked out well. I've been busy in my spreadsheet over here. He's our guest on episode number 355. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to mention somebody who has not um, been your guest. But, um, anyway, so um, one of the big changes, I think, is, uh, um, and we didn't really know enough yet about large-scale production of AI when we first um, wrote that article, to realize that data scientists were probably not well suited to doing everything that was necessary uh, to create uh, an effective data product. Um, they're really good at, you know, fitting models to data and, uh, you know, tinkering with algorithms and feature engineering and all that sort of thing. But most data scientists, I think, are not really good at many of the other things you have to do if you're going to successfully deploy a model into production and manage it over time. Things like, you know, building the trust of senior executives to, to adopt the model for their business in the first place and retraining the people who do the day-to-day -day work and redesigning the business process and may, uh, integrating the model um, into your existing IT architecture and scaling it um, so that it can, you know, handle lots and lots of concurrent users and so on. So um, now I think we've realized we still need this model building capability um, for the most part. I mean, we also have this issue of automated machine learning, which can do, you know, the more mundane aspects of that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But we have things like um, machine learning engineers and data engineers and machine learning operations people and translators and data product managers and so on, who we also need if we're going to be successful with um, deployment of successful data products. And so that means that, you know, data scientists can no longer pretend to be unicorns. If they did, they... Um, <laughs> Uh, they need to be members of a of a team that works together. I think that you know good data scientists need to worry about whether their models are getting deployed or not. If they aren't, I think they're not going to be successfully employed uh, for by a company anyway. But um, you know, oh. every everybody can have their specialties. Oh, I just gave you. I, I just had an idea for a great uh, article title. So we, you know, we have uh, in academia, we have of course publish or perish, yeah. and uh, so now you could have deploy or be unemployed. It's as, as, as close. <laughs> deploy to be employed. I don't know. There's something yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I didn't really realize this. I. Um, I wrote an article once, there's a relatively new journal coming out of Harvard, my um, graduate school alma mater, and you had um, Xiao Li um, on yes, Shao Li one Mike. of your episodes. Yes. Yeah, he's the first editor and creator of this Harvard Data Science Journal, and I, I loved him. He was great. He was dean of the graduate school um, after I left, did wonders for their statistics department. But um, I wrote this it's supposed to be an opinion piece, a column, but Xiao Li believes in getting everything, you know, peer reviewed. So I wrote, you know, data scientists need to worry about deployment. And two out of the three of the peer reviewers said, no, they don't. <laughs> um, and I was shocked. You know, I thought that this was self-evident that, you know, um, deploy or be uh, unemployed. Um, <laughs> 
And um, so I had to kind of water down the message somewhat in that article. And since then, I've focused a fair amount on on that issue because, you know, there's a lot of data suggesting that data science models, the majority don't get deployed at all mm-hmm. and they don't produce economic value as a mm-hmm. result. Yeah, that's right. It's it's a small fraction. It's like 10 or 20 percent. Of yeah, data I mean, it shouldn't be 100 yeah. percent, obviously, but it should be higher than 13 percent or yeah. some one of the figures cited. Yeah. And so for those of you who really want the episode numbers, Shaoli Meng's episode number 581. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's actually Shaoli's episode is one of my favorites ever. It's uh, it's jam packed with really interesting uh, conversation. He's such a fun guy. And he did, you know, he brought to the statistics courses at Harvard, he brought things like dating and wine and chocolate and so on, things that had never been discussed in a statistics mm-hmm. classroom before. There's a lot of those specific topics yeah. in the episode, yeah. actually. <laughs> um, and that bring this the the point that you're making about data scientists potentially being worried about their um, their employment. Um, I I think they should be concerned. I think uh, there is, or or rather, the way of phrasing it is that if you think that these skills, you know, creating using Scikit-Learn to create a machine learning model, that in and of itself is not enough uh, in the, in in this field anymore. And so I constantly say on air a very common question that I ask our guests is you know what do you look for in people that you hire or what roles do you have open and uh so because we have quite a few guests who are like CEOs of fast growing uh startups you know they've just raised 100 million dollars what kinds of roles are you hiring for they are not always hiring data scientists sometimes they are but typically there's just a few positions and they can typically find really great people to fill those roles however all of these people without fail evergreen job description out there for software developers, things like machine learning engineers, data engineers, these exact roles that you've described that are adjacent to data science, that are either building the plumbing, in the case of the data engineer, that is flowing uh, the data into the models for the data scientist, or the machine learning engineer that's bringing it into a production system. Um, Yeah, so I'm always, I frequently encouraging listeners to be picking up software developer skills where they can, even if they are uh, a, a quote unquote pure data scientist. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the job that it is increasingly going to kind of coordinate all of those different roles and make sure everybody's, you know, collaborating to create a good outcome is the data product manager. And that, um, you know, not terribly well recognized in a lot of businesses yet, but I think it will join prompt engineer in, in the future list of uh, fast growing jobs in in the world of, of data science. Yep, agreed. And um, yeah, having recently had somebody join my machine learning company, Nebula, Alice, uh, she came from France. Uh, Alice is how it's spelt <laughs> uh, to the Anglophones. Uh, and uh, her title isn't data product manager, but that is effectively, you know, she's product manager for um, a data product. (laughs) So she might as well have that job title. And it's been a game changer. Uh, She's been working with data scientists on her team a lot. And somebody in that role who's really good about thinking uh, about how users will interact with outputs from models or um, data distributions, any kind of data that's uh, being fed into or out of a model it's been a game changer for us. And so I think that that is a, it's, it, I'm really, I, I, I think it's great that you're highlighting that particular role. It's not one that we've talked about on air before, to my knowledge. Yeah, well, um, there's a guy named Brian O'Neill who also has a podcast. Maybe you, you can uh, appear on each other's podcast or something, but he's quite oriented to the sort of design and user interface aspects of data products. And then there are other ones too. I think that the whole idea of ML ops, which you've recently had a podcast on, I'm sure you'll come up with the number in a second. <laughs> it's too um, many. <laughs> yeah. But that's, you know, the ongoing management of models is something that data product managers have to be worried about too. Are people 
Are customers using it? Uh, has the world changed? So the model needs to be retrained. Um, uh, the machine can tell you some of these things, but it still requires some human oversight. And product managers are still, you know, perform their jobs in other areas after products are released into the into the world. And I think they need to here too.